defamation in hindi we call it manhani this is such an interesting aspect of law i find it especially interesting as i've actually been a counsel on defamation cases and the most interesting defamation case was one where i was one of the counsels representing a large number of defendants in a defamation suit now what made this case even more interesting was that the defendants we were representing in that case had spoken out against a man that they had worked with claiming that he had harassed him sexually and this was during the me too movement now as a response he filed a defamation suit against all of them and a defamation suit like this filed in response to public statement by a whistle blower is commonly called as a slap or a strategic lawsuit against public participation now once again welcome to the utsa mukherjee ip and tech law show today is our 18th episode and boy do i like the sound of that number now defamation is of two kinds one is civil defamation and the other is criminal defamation now let me start with civil defamation i'll break it down and make it simple for you civil defamation is when a statement is made about another person which lowers their reputation in the minds of the right thinking thinking members of society so now this can be of two kinds right one is libel or when the defamatory statement is made in writing and the other is slander when the defamatory statement is made orally so this simply means that if i publicly say or write something about you which makes the general public think less of you or if it harms your image your reputation then that would be defamation right now it's important that in a case of defamation we establish that the statement has been made categorically against you and has been communicated to a third party right so for example if i make a statement against you uh, you know in the reference that i say something about your entire community or about uh, your whole religion your nationality your ethnicity your entire neighborhood that is not a statement categorically against you right so that would not be considered defamation right but if i make if i say that you know you belong to this particular community and you individually have uh, say very bad behavior and i you know and that statement is categorically made about you then that can be called a defamatory statement and it's also important that it is to be made to a third person right somebody other than you then only it would constitute civil defamation now there are certain defenses that are available in a case of civil defamation right and the first and the strongest defense in such cases is that the statement was true right if we can show the court that the statement is substantially true then you will be fine right and another great defense that i can think of which which is commonly used in such cases which we which we had used is fair comment right and a fair comment simply put is an opinion made on a matter of public interest right or on a public personality or an issue which concerns the public at large so it has to be made in the form of an opinion first of all right it cannot be an assertion of fact and it also has to be made without any malice without any ill will right hence the word fair is used for fair comment and it has to be based on what a person actually believes to be true right so if if you don't yourself believe something to be true you know that it is false and you make that comment say and you say that it's in public interest that won't be covered right under the defense of fair comment but then these two defenses of fair comment and truth are substantially what we ourselves used when we were defending the defendant defendants in the against accusations of sexual harassment in the case that i was referring to earlier and some of these defendants had made statements on social media based on their own experiences right which they said were true while others were journalists and activists who commented on those social media posts or wrote pieces about them believing them to be true so hence the defenses of truth and fair comment are very much applicable and were very much relied upon in many cases now what made our case stronger was that the fact that the accusations had been made by a large number of women implied that they are more likely to be true right and then there is a third common defense which is used in cases of defamation this defense is the statements were privileged now one of the facets of this is absolute privilege right this means that the statements are protected by law and that such statements are made during court trials or made in parliamentary proceedings or in official communications and the other kind of privilege statement is qualified privileged right which applies that the statements have been made by reporters or in public interest so these are the two kinds of privilege now let's come to criminal defamation 
criminal defamation is defined in section 499 of the Indian Penal Code and the punishment for the offence is prescribed in section 500 of the code. Now the main distinction between civil and criminal defamation is of intent. So a defamatory statement becomes criminal when it is made with the specific intent to cause damage to another person's reputation or when a person has knowledge that such a statement can defame another, right? Now, the punishment for criminal defamation is imprisonment for a year or two, along with fine or both. It is, however, a bailable, non-cognizable and a compoundable offence, which means that a person accused of criminal defamation has an automatic right to bail and the complainant will have to first approach the court and get the magistrate to issue a direction to the police to register a complaint and then the case can be settled by way of compromise between the parties. So all of this indicates that it is a less severe criminal offence as compared to other criminal offences of a more serious nature such as say murder or rape which are generally non-bailable, they're not compoundable and you know they're also cognizable offences. Now in contrast to criminal defamation, in cases of civil defamation what we generally seek is very much similar to trademark and copyright cases. We seek an injunction asking the defendant to def delete their defamatory statement from the social media pages or publicly wherever they have posted it or published it and to apologize for making such statements and also to pay up monetary damages for the loss of reputation that they have caused to the plaintiff. Now in the cases where as for the defendants, the plaintiff had not even sought monetary damages. He only demanded that the plaintiffs apologize but the defendants, uh, sorry, I meant the defendants apologize for their defamatory statements and that such statements be taken down from social media portals and a token amount of one rupee be paid, right, by each defendant. Now, many a times, newspapers and media houses are sued for defamation. Journalists often invoke the defense of fair comment and truth. The case of MJ Akbar versus Priya Ramani is a famous one in this regard. Ever since the Me Too movement, we have seen many cases of defamation being filed as a counter to sexual harassment allegations. We have also seen cases where sexual harassment allegations and public statements have been motivated by malice and are not true in their entirety. This may sometimes happen in, say, professional settings, where disgruntled subordinates or spurned lovers resort to such unfair means to tarnish another person's reputation. On the other hand, many a times, these statements are indeed true. And there are cases where a person has really exploited their position, you know, uh, high up the ranks of the corporate ladder or, you know, in a company where they use that position to exploit and to harass people who are working under them or are, who are not such an, an as strong a position as them, right? And as lawyers, we get to see all kinds of cases. So that's it, folks, for today. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. And it was something slightly different from the topics that I normally cover, you know, under trademark law. And uh, this is still very much interrelated to IPR. There are certain aspects which are interconnected between defamation and IP, which I'll cover maybe in, in a future episode, possibly maybe even in the, the very next one. And uh, I would definitely suggest that you stay tuned for more interesting episodes on IP, tech law and related areas, especially if you're somebody who is from the legal world, say somebody who's interested in IPR or you're an house counsel in a company or a corporate lawyer or you're a practicing litigator or, you know, you are somebody who is a law student or somebody who generally just wants to learn about law, right? Because, you know, one of the things they say is that uh, ignorantia juris non exucat, which is a very famous Latin maxim, that you saying that you do not know the law or you're ignorant about the law is no excuse. The law will still come after you. <laughs> so you might as well learn about the law. So thank you very much.